Hi and welcome to Funds Focus Introduction to Fixed Income. Uh, we thought we'd put together this webinar following on from the recent um, uh, rush of new hybrid and bond issues um, and we've, we've obviously seen a lot of interest from investors who are a bit disheartened with, uh, with the equity markets right now. Um, so yeah, quickly moving on. Um, the first thing I need to say to you is uh, that um, this uh, presentation is considered to be general advice. We haven't taken into account your own personal circumstances and if you're unsure or uh, looking for a bit more clarification, um, you should uh, take your own independent financial advice. Okay, so I thought I'd start by just giving you a little bit of background as to who we are, where we're coming from in terms of um, why we've looked at uh, fixed income products. Um, the, the business basically falls into just two sides. So we, we are wealth focus. We have the funds focus investment newsletter, which is, um, so funds focus is the non-advice side of the business, which allows investors to, um, to uh, either access um, things like the IPOs, so get access to investments they normally couldn't get hold of. So for example, we're, getting, we're giving access to broker firm allocations uh, rather than you having to wait for the um, general and shareholder offers. Or alternatively, if you're looking at uh, investing in managed funds, most of the time we're, uh, we're waiving the uh, upfront commissions on those products. Um, the other side of the business is a full uh, personal advice service where we sit down with you and we tailor portfolios um, around your situation. Um, it's typically, we typically work on a fee-for-service basis. We don't take any commissions, um, or typically don't take any commissions within the products, um, and we get a bit more proactive in terms of your asset allocation and um, moving you uh, in and out of the markets at, at particular times. Okay, so a good place to start, I think, is why do investors use fixed income, or why do we use fixed income? within our portfolios. And it, again, just going back to um, a article I wrote last year, I, I wrote an article on uh, when 7% per annum is greater than 12% per annum. It's actually get aim, um, aiming at uh, um, investors coming up to retirement or needing to take an income. Um, you can actually view the article itself on the website, fundsfocus.com.au. It's in the March 2011 newsletter. But if I just take you through uh, through a couple of scenarios there, um, I think the argument uh, along amongst a lot of investors is, well, look, equities, I can get a return of about 12% per annum out of them. Um, when I wrote this article back in May last year, you could get about 7% per annum out of a five-year term deposit. Now we're looking at a lot less than that, but um, at the same time, uh, there are other fixed income products out there uh, giving you these types of returns. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you can either get a fixed return of 7% each year or by going in the markets, you never get 12% per annum in a straight line. Um, so I've given the scenario of, look, what happens if you had a big fall and then you had the market recovery and you had quite a strong recovery after that. So giving a return of 60% over the five years and averaging 12% in each of those years. Um, by contrast, if you just had it in the term deposit giving you 7% or if you got a fixed return of just 7%. Now you could say, okay, well look, if I took that uh, that money and compounded it, it's not very fair of you to, to use 7 and 12 because that 7% would give me um, a greater return. You're right, it would give you eight, just over 8% a year if you just kept reinvesting that money. Or alternatively, if you took your 12% um, average, um, but if you were compounding because you've lost 30% in the first year, uh, that would give you a much lower return, but you've still got 9% a year return there versus the eight, just over 8% from uh, from the fixed income products that I was uh, using as an example. Now the issue here, so th there's no argument in terms of um, who they're giving you a better return there, but the, the issue here is if you need to take income. And so what I've taken here is an example where you need to take uh, 7%. So I've used 100,000 just because it's a nice round number. 7% is $7,000 a year. So let's say you need $7,000 a year income from your investment. And if you have a look at, um, uh, if you have a look at uh, um, 
here you're taking $7,000 out, um, growing over the course of the year, take $7,000 out and so on. If we then use the same scenario that we were just looking at um, a moment ago, where we're falling by 30%, we've then taken the 7,000 out here. I mean, at the end of the day, the markets have fallen, but you can't just turn around and say, look, I don't want to eat for this year. I'll, I'll wait until the markets recover. Um, and so you've still had to take 7,000 out. The markets have recovered a little bit, or a flat year the, the following year. Um, we've taken a 7,000 out again. We then had a recovery of 20%, taking 7,000 out, 29 and 36. And the interesting thing there is because you've been taking money out at these lower, the same amount of money out at these lower levels, you've actually ended up with less than you, you started off with, even though you had a, a better average return over those five years than, than a fixed income product. So really the, the emphasis there is that, look, when you're looking at taking an income, you just can't um, afford to uh, uh, have the volatility in your portfolio that you that you could have put up with when you weren't needing to take an income. So the other the other thing I look at with fixed income is as to why we use it. We also use it as um, as a way of stabilizing investor portfolios. Um, and one of the things we look at is how they correlate with equities. And what I mean by that is, do they go up and down together with equities? Or do they, um, uh, you know, do they perform in their own right? Um, now, w if you look at um, high-grade corporate bonds, so um, we'll come on to that in a moment. But those types of bonds that are higher up the debt structure, and government bonds, they typically have a negative correlation to equities. Um, so, if we have a, a look at example of ANZ, I got this chart courtesy of uh, BT Investment Management. Um, if we had a look at how ANZ did um, ANZ shares in the GFC, just give me a moment, I'll get the pointer here. Um, so if we have a look, ANZ shares fell almost 60% over the course of the GFC. <coughs> By contrast, if we look at ANZ bonds, uh, which were uh, quite high up in the, in the debt structure, so high grade bond, um, what we've seen there is the, the value of the bonds actually gone, gone up in value. Um, and so that, um, by mixing these two together within a portfolio, um, it tends to pull us away from these roller coaster highs and lows that we uh, that we get associated with in, in just being in equities. Um, okay, just a second. Okay, so. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, types of investors that we see coming through. So I, I would actually say you can put investors into two brackets when looking at fixed income. You've got the investors who, um, who are typically just looking for an alternative to, to term deposits, um, but they might, I mean, they realize there's a little bit more risk within these than, than a term deposit, but they're not really concerned about market movements. Um, they're looking just for a headline income rate and they're looking uh, for a large brand. So, um, uh, and, and really, they're not just not concerned about the uh, the structure whatsoever. Um, they're just happy that they're getting a, a greater return than they were within uh, within the term deposit alternative. The other basket uh, of investors, I'd say, is, is active investors. Those that want to ensure they're getting an adequate return for the risk that they're taking. Um, and I, that's where I put ourselves in as as advisors. So, what I'd say is, look, fixed income products can differ very significantly. Um, and as a result, uh, you've got to realize that the differences in the, in the fixed income products uh, will mean that they behave differently in differing market conditions as well. So, you know, really what, the way we're looking at them is that these different products, we just view them as, as tools that we can use in different market conditions. You take something very simple like falling and rising interest rates, um, a, a fixed uh, a bond that is producing a fixed income, um, i.e., it's not going to go up and down with interest rates, uh, becomes obviously becomes more attractive when when interest rates start to fall, um, and vice versa when interest rates start to rise, they become less attractive and tend to fall in value. Um, at the same time, we look at uh, where the securities sit in the debt structure, and uh, the more secure a bond is, um, the more attractive it is um, in falling markets because usually you're starting to question. 
the profitability of these companies and their ability to repay this debt back to you, um, or uh, uh, and vice versa. In, in rising markets, um, you probably want to be in uh, some of the um, some of the lower grade credit, which is likely to rise quicker um, in a rising market. So, the way we look at things, we 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 actually take a two basket approach to our fixed income. So we, <clears throat> rather than just saying, okay, here's your um, allocation to fixed income and to bonds, um, we actually split into two. We 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 have two emphases. Is one is um, focusing on the return of capital, um, and what I mean by that is investors. Uh, we shouldn't really see much of a movement in the value, or the cash in value, or the um, price on market when we see big falls in the market. Um, so that's a, a focus on return of capital. That's a lower risk basket, um, and with those, you tend to uh, see lower incomes being paid. Um, and the second one is the return on capital, so our, our higher risk basket, um, and those are the, the types of um, products that are paying much higher returns. Um, but that's because we're taking a little bit more risk in in our fixed income. Okay, so I just thought we'd take you through some of the factors to consider. Um, again, going back to the investors who aren't really concerned about the underlying products and so on, they'll typically, this is a, typically the measure that they look at is the uh, quality or security of the company. They tend to like big brand names um, and they just view these companies aren't going to go out of business and therefore I'm just going to put my money into it and, and take an income. Um, and the way they, may, they might view that in terms of risk is they might look at Woolies and, uh, and the banks say, okay, well, they're very, very secure. AGL, Origin Energy, probably middle of the road. HealthScope, um, well, we can't see their financials because they're owned by a private equity firm, and so they're a, they're a higher risk company and they're a, they're a smaller company. Um, uh, again, we, we'd say, yes, we, that's one of the things that we look at, but it's only uh, one aspect. There's a lot more that, uh, that you should consider. First and foremost, I'd say, is where the debt sits within the capital structure. Um, so let's take, for example, um, oh, where was I here? I'll just go back. So let's take, for example, um, uh, one of the banks and have a look at how their debt structure is set up. So as a uh, term deposit holder, uh, and what I mean by the debt structure, what I'm talking about there is if the bank was to go bust, Who's going to get their money first, um, and what, in what order is it is it paid out? So the thing to note there is ordinary deposit holders are right at the, the top of the list here. They're the first to get their their money. Um, ordinary shareholders are the last to get their money. So where these issues sit within the debt structure uh, it is the key thing that that we're looking at here. So um, uh, yeah, so if, using some of the terms that are used in the industry. We're looking at senior debt sitting behind deposits, um, subordinated secure debt. Subordinated means it's subordinated to the um, to some other debt, which is usually the senior debt. Subordinated unsecured debt. So unsecured will sit behind secured because that's secured against some some type of property or um, assets. Um, and behind that, we've then got the hybrid securities uh, before the ordinary shareholders. So hybrid securities are probably where we're looking at for most of the issues that are currently on on market right now. Um, an important thing is that when you're looking at the debt structure, sounds obvious, but look, the more risk you're taking, the more you should expect to get paid for that. And at the same time, the other thing I would say that's important to note is that the longer you're tying your money up for, the more you should expect to get paid for it as well. So some of, if, you're, if you're looking at a seven-year investment with a company versus a three-year, um, then you should expect to get paid uh, for the additional risk of holding your money for an extra four years and therefore you want a higher return on that. So uh, just going through a couple of examples of the recent issues. Um, CBA HA is um, CBA retail bonds that were issued uh, just a couple of years ago. They're very high in debt structure and sit just behind uh, deposit holders. Um, with those, you're expecting they're, they're actually yielding 1.05% over the bank bill swap rate. So that that shows how um, you know that's because of where they are 
in terms of security. Um, and then some of the more recent issues, so if we look at the historical issues, ANZPA, that's ANZ CPS2 and CBA Pearls 5 um, and some of, the, some of the Westpac hybrids. This is where hybrids have typically sat uh, in this, um, uh, this part of the debt structure. Um, now they're, they're paying a return, so ANZPAs are paying 3.1 over the bank bill swap rate, CBAPA uh, 3.4% over the bank bill swap rate. Now by contrast, the more recent issues, so ANZ subordinated notes, if I can find my cursor again, here we go, ANZ subordinated notes and the NAV subordinated notes as well as the colonial subordinated notes are, are higher in the debt structure and that's why you've seen um, a reduction in terms of the yields that are being offered. So they're paying 2.75% over the bank bill swap rate. Um, but at the same time, they're offering you a little bit more security. Okay, so um, I'd say one of the, the other, another important factor is the security of, of having a maturity date. Um, one of the questions that has come through uh, time and time again with uh, with the registrations for the webinar was uh, was actually with regards to NAB um, NABHAR, which is the first hybrid note to um, to be issued on the ASX back in 99 Um that's uh, that's seen a, a, a fall in uh, a, a fall in price, and um, so I just thought I'd cover off um, uh, how why it's important to have a maturity date within these. Um, so, just looking at uh, NABHAR, that was issued back in 99, 2000. I was saying uh, the interest rate at that time, or still is, is one and a quarter percent over the bank bill swap rate. Um, bank bill swap rate is currently around three and a half percent. And typically uh, moves up and down with the RBA rate, roughly speaking. Um, so yeah, so that just gives you an, an idea. So pre-GFC, uh, you'd expect to get one to one quarter percent over the bank bill swap rate for this type of issue. Post-GFC, that's gone up to about three, three point one percent. So because NAB was a perpetual, or sorry, NABHAR is a perpetual security and has no maturity date. If we have a look. Pre-GFC, it just tracked along around its face value of $100. Um, now, what we saw during the GFC was the concern that is NAB going to be around in business? And at the same time, the cost of borrowing went up. So the price dropped all the way down to, to $56, um, then recovered up to around uh, just over $80, um, and it's gradually been coming back down again. We're around $68, I think, um, as, of, uh, as of today. Um, the, the the main thing you've got there, the reason it hasn't recovered back up to $100 is purely to do with um, the cost of borrowing has increased. So for a similar security today, you'd be over 3%. And so when you're looking at um, it trading around $68, that's giving you a similar type of return to if that security being issued today. Um, so I don't really see that price coming back up anytime soon. And uh, to be quite frank, I don't really see NAB uh, willing to repay that um, uh, repay that anytime soon either. They've got a very very cheap source of funding at one and a quarter percent over the bank bill swap rate. Um, interestingly enough, uh, one of the brokers that uh, that we've used uh, for clients has um, has got a solution. Fig Securities has got a solution for uh, for those investors with, with an alternative. Um, but at the same time, what I thought I'd also do is compare that to another security, um, IAGPA, which was paying a similar rate of interest, 1.1% over the bank bill swap rate. The difference being with this one is that investors had the opportunity to redeem at face value in June 2007 and also in June 2012. And so what you saw there is as we came back to June 2007, um, tracked back towards a hundred dollar face value which is what you'd expect um, just after that because of the GFC we saw these huge falls same as NABHAR we had these big concerns about is IAG going to be in business in a few years um, are they going to be able to repay repay their debt so we saw these big falls didn't fall as much as NABHAR and that's purely because we know that in June 2012 assuming IAG is still around at that time um, that you're going to get hundred dollars back for, or you can exchange $100, your uh, shares for a $100 face value. 
And so that's why we've seen it, although it's only paying 1.1% over the bank bill swap, that's why we've seen over, over time it coming back to the $100 face value. And in fact, the, the maturity day actually threw up an opportunity. This uh, just thought I'd take you through an example of uh, one of the things that we were doing with clients. Um, we were having a look at this from back in January, February time, and noticed that uh, the, the price had, um, had dropped. Um, with the flood of new issues that came on market, um, we were noticing that uh, investors, I think, were, were selling out of this, not necessarily aware that they could um, exchange it for $100 um, get their money back at $100 uh, face value in, uh, in June and um, had, had sold it right down. Um, now, I'm not talking about huge amounts here, but if we just go back to um, uh, the date that we looked at this, so we were looking at this on 21st of May. The maturity date was 15th of June, which is actually today. Um, and if what we knew at that point is, that, look, the yield is 5.61%. Gross, including the franking, is 8.02. The price that we could buy for on market was $102.31, uh, assuming the cost of trade is 0.12 as well, which we're coming to in a moment. Um, but with accumulated interest of $3.86, including franking, and there was another $0.15 cents to accrue. So about $4 at maturity, um, and it was going to cost us $102.31. So we're going to lose $2.31, uh, but we were going to pick up four dollars minus the cost of our trade and um, our percentage return was 1.54 based on our hundred two dollars hundred two dollars thirty one now you might look at that and say oh that's not a lot of, lot of money but for three weeks if you then annualize that over the course of a year uh, that's a twenty two and a half percent return and the risk within this one was really is IAG going to go bust in, uh, in in the next three three weeks um, we thought that's a, a million to one shot. Oh, and by the way, if it did go bust, where do we sit in the debt structure? We're higher up than ordinary shareholders and so on. Okay, so aside from that, the other question we get asked frequently is, how do these things behave um, in the falling market? Um, now, I've, I've covered off um, the high-grade uh, corporate bonds and government bonds a little bit earlier uh, with the ANZ bond. I actually thought we'd use the ANZ hybrid ANZPA, which pays 3.1% over the bank bill swap rate, as, a, as an example again. So let's have a look, if, um, if we have a look back to August last year. Now the bank shares fell around 8% in two days in August 2011. That's off the back of the US being downgraded by the ratings agencies and um, a huge equity sell-off uh, globally. At the same time, um, hybrids fell uh, on average around 4%. Um, so it gives you some idea that it does have, it does get impacted by, uh, um, should we say, it does track somewhat with uh, with equities, but it tends to be the big sharp falls that, uh, that you'll see that will affect the hybrid prices. When we start seeing um, small sell-offs in the market, um, they typically uh, just um, uh, track along nicely. Um, it's really when you start seeing these big falls uh, that you'll see big sell-offs in, in hybrids as well. Um, then if we look to February of this year, this is a time where we've seen a really big sell-off. Uh, part of this is due to a flood of new issues in the market. And so what we saw is investors moving out of um, ANZ uh, PA or, or out of the bank hybrids and trying to diversify in some of the other issues, so the AGL, um, just trying to think of something colonial that, that came to market as well, um, and IAG did another issue. Um, and at the same time, uh, we also went ex-dividend as well. So that was a, another reason for, for a fall in price. Following on from that, we saw some recovery, and then more recently we've had the interest rate cuts, and so we've had uh, investors fearful that uh, um, they're going to keep seeing their returns being dropping on, on these types of issues, and so they've moved to to the fixed, um, the fixed rate bonds that are available um, and at the same time we saw falls, some significant falls in the share market um, and also at the same time again we went to X dividend. So that explains what's happened over here. Now the other thing I'd say to, to note is um, going back to the security of a maturity date, 
there, there is also opportunity. We've just gone ex-dividend here, and the price is $97.91. But you know that in um, uh, at the maturity date, which I think is 2006, begin, January 2016 for ANZPA, uh, let's see, that's three and a half years from now. Yep, three and a half years from now. Uh, that you're going to get a hundred dollars back for uh, for each of these um, shares, and so you can you could argue that look, I'm getting it ninety seven dollars ninety one, um, so that means my return three point one is based on a hundred dollar note, so I'm probably getting it about three point one five three point two percent. At the same time, I've got three and a half years. I'm going to get an extra uh, just over three dollars in um, capital gain as well and so you could in theory um, add another one percent return onto that 3.1 so or 3.2 so we're, we're looking at about 4.2 over the bank bill swap rate if you hold them until maturity um, the other thing that's often overlooked is the accrued income so um, and we, we get these uh, this type of research from a lot of the brokers and uh, um, research houses out there but um, you know it just gives you gives you an idea one of the things that we're looking at when we're looking to buy uh, and compare these and looking for value on market is not just to look at the price but to incorporate the accrued income that's in there so if for example you're looking at um, uh, where are we CBA PA you might look at that and say oh, 199 dollars 40 um, or oh, actually, let's use uh, let's use a, yeah. In fact, sorry, let's go back to that. So, hundred hundred ninety nine dollars forty. But at the same time, you've actually got accrued income there of a dollar twenty twenty four. This has got a two hundred dollar face value. That's that's it's not a hundred dollar face value. Um, so, in reality, if you're purchasing that, you're picking up for about one hundred ninety eight dollars on market. Um, and so, the yield that you're picking up at currently, which includes the bank bill swap rate and the franking, is 7.08%. But bear in mind you're going to get some um, capital back if you hold it to maturity, and so the yield to maturity is actually 7.6% a year. Okay, so I thought I'd also list some of the things to look out for. Uh, one is, as, as I've been saying throughout, is the maturity date. Is the security a perpetual? Or is it for a fixed term? Now, I'm not saying because um, because it has these things in there. For example, if it's a perpetual security, that um, don't invest in it. What I'm saying is a perpetual has more risk than um, a fixed term product, and therefore I want to get paid an additional premium for that extra risk that I'm taking. Um, the other thing to note is that uh, although some, particularly recently we've seen some of these issues have a 25 or 30 year or um, 35 year uh, maturity date, um, you would generally expect them to be paid at the first call date. And the reason for that is primarily the impact that that has on their ability to borrow money in the market. And um, if you think of the amount of money that they're borrowing uh, via the uh, of these listed securities actually a fraction of or typically a fraction of what they're borrowing in the institutional and the wholesale markets um, that uh, you know it, it really impacts on them if if they um, if they lose the trust of investors and uh, uh, wholesale investors and, and institutional investors um, then they'll be forced to pay a higher premium next time because they'll just look at them as a wholesaler, you know, as an institutional investor, coming to them and say, "Well, why uh, um, you, you didn't repay at the first opportunity, and therefore uh, there's a question of trust as to whether you're going to do that to us on on this next issue. Therefore, I want to get paid an additional premium for that extra risk that is now uh, now inherent in investing with you." The other thing I'd say is uh, is actually the impact on the credit rating, um, and so. The, the big companies that have large amounts of debt uh, that have credit ratings with the like of um, S and P, uh, there, there's um, there's an implied uh, risk to them as well. In that, um, 
when uh, when a credit with with a lot of these issues, the credit ratings agencies will look at them and say, "Look, uh, we realise that we know this is really borrowing, but um, if you repay it within within the first five years, we'll consider it to be equity." And so, uh, when we rate you as a as a company, um, you will have a higher credit rating than uh, than you would if you held that as as pure debt. Now, if they don't repay it at the first opportunity, you know, for example, the first five years. Um, then that impacts on their credit rating because all of a sudden it gets considered to be debt. Credits ratings agencies, one will say, well, there's an issue with you in terms of reputational risk. Secondly, um, this is now, you've now got an additional so many hundreds of millions of dollars on your books as, uh, as debt and therefore we're going to give you a lower credit rating. That again then impacts on their ability to borrow money. The lower the credit rating, the higher the cost of borrowing. The other thing is, is there any penalties if they don't repay at the expected call date? <clears throat> what I was just alluding to there is that um, it's not such a big issue uh, as you'd initially think. However, uh, you still, you know, you still need to be aware of it. So this is typically called a step up. So if um, if they don't repay at the first date, you typically want to see some type of step up of maybe. 1%, 2% as a penalty um, on the interest rate for uh, not having repaid when, when you're expected. So you need to be compensated for them not repaying it. Um, again, the uh, the recent trend has been to reduce that down to about quarter of a percent or, or to zero. Um, whilst it is a concern, again, you, you need to understand that actually this is a lot of this is driven by how the credit ratings agencies are um, are assessing uh, these issues and so the higher the step up is um, the more likely they are to consider a greater proportion of that to be debt rather than equity when they rate when they rate the company um, are there any mandatory deferment conditions so what I mean by that is um, if we look at if they so for example going back to ANZPA again actually um, ANZPA in 2016 uh, there is a mandatory so they they have a maturity date um, but there's a mandatory deferment if their share price has fallen below a certain level which is I think roughly about 50 60 percent uh, fall in the share price um, Going back to what I was saying, where does it sit in the debt structure? Uh, I think we've covered that off. Uh, the other thing, are there any comparables trading in the market? That's that's generally our first port of call when we're trying to assess um, assess a new issue. Is we're, we're desperately looking around. Is there any other comparables in the market, and how does this differ? And are you getting paid enough of a premium for anything that's that's uh, slightly worse, or if it's slightly better? Um, you know the the rate. You should expect the rate to be a little bit less than the, the comparable on market. Um, going back to the payment of coupons, this actually falls into the mandatory deferment that I was talking about earlier. Are the income payments mandatory? Believe it or not, income payments aren't always mandatory. Um, you can generally rely on them to come through with the bigger companies because, again, it goes back to that reputational risk. Um, but uh, if you were to say, for example, look at the recent Seek subordinated notes that came uh, that came to market um, and didn't actually get ahead, what uh, what their condition said is that one, it was a perpetual security, so they didn't have to pay you back if they didn't choose to pay you back. Um, but secondly, the income payments were were not mandatory, so they could stop them at any time. And oddly enough, um, they were non-cumulative, so. If, uh, so they could actually stop payments to you. They wouldn't have to if they stopped the payments to you. They wouldn't have to make up for them, and they didn't have to give you your money back at any time either. Um, now there, there was other um, caveats in there which protected uh, protected your payments, uh, which was really the threat that if uh, if they stopped payments to you, then they wouldn't be able to pay ordinary shareholders. But we saw that we didn't like the issue because we just viewed the risk as being too high from the point of view that um, if uh, if the company was to get into dire straits 
um, the last thing they're going to be concerned about is making payments to their ordinary shareholders and so they could just take an interest free loan on uh, on, on your subordinated notes um, but I would probably put that at the top end of the risk spectrum uh, the other thing is if they stop payments can they continue to pay to ordinary shells uh, we'll just cover that okay so um, things to look out for um, uh, or one of the things that we look at with our baskets um, the lower risk versus a higher risk um, what we're looking for in uh, lower risk is that we want it to have a negative correlation with the share market or not to correlate with the share market so it gives you that security that if the share market falls and you need to access capital uh, generally speaking you're going to get around the same amounts of money that you put in if not a little bit more um, the higher risk uh, higher risk part of the basket of the fixed income basket um, is really about trying to get as much income as possible um, and we're not overly concerned if they uh, if they fall uh, with the share market as well um, obviously we're still concerned that uh, of the quality of the company and that you are going to get your money back eventually um, but to us it's all about uh, how it correlates with other investments we're looking at the other question that we we, we get asked a lot is um, trying to understand how the pricing works once uh, once these investments uh, are listed um, I'd say when you're looking at the pricing don't forget the value of the accrued interest and the franking credits um, the other thing to note on that is when you see the interest rates being quoted uh, the fixed income products quote interest rates inclusive of franking credits it's not plus franking uh, unlike dividends uh, on, on ordinary shares um, that's a common mistake um, and also uh, things like fixed interest rates um, the, the value of, uh, of those bonds will typically go up when interest rates fall and, uh, and vice versa when interest rates rise they'll typically fall in value um, now the golden rule when you're looking at these uh, the greater the risk the greater the return i.e. the more you're getting as an income just be aware there's a greater risk um, attached to it and so just make sure make sure you can understand uh, understand the product so so how do we how do we structure our client portfolios I thought I'd give you some insight into, into what we do <clears throat> might help you um, in terms of when you're structuring your portfolios or hopefully you'll uh, give us a call and maybe we can help you structure your portfolio as well so the first thing we do uh, is we look into the crystal ball um, but uh, for some reason it, uh, it never seems to work so uh, um, so we put that to one side and uh, um, actually I just thought we'd give you an idea of uh, a balanced portfolio and um, uh, you know how you could structure that so uh, our portfolios will, will change based on where we see value at any one time but this is a typical client portfolio and one way of looking at it is you say look I'm a, I'm a balanced investor and therefore I'm going to put um, I'm going to put all my money into uh, uh, tier one securities and uh, so Tier one is our tier one is our lower risk um, for us is is our lower risk fixed income. Tier two is what we consider to be our higher risk fixed income. When I say higher risk, I don't mean uh, uh, as risky as equities. I just mean relative to uh, the lower risk fixed income. And so you can see this is what our expected return is over ten year period versus uh, tier two. And so what we're if you if you were to put all the uh, um, all into tier one debt, the issue you've got there is the reduced um, expected return over uh, over the next ten years. Um, the other thing you could do is you can add a little bit of um, a, a little bit of allocation towards Aussie equities um, and some towards international equities to try and get the the higher rates of return. Where we're seeing value at the moment is really in the high grade. Um, corporate bonds uh, corporate debt um, so th that's where uh, that's where we see value in uh, in client portfolios at the moment and I'd say we're probably a little bit overweight in this area because of it okay so again just having a look at some of the recent issues ANZPA um, although we put it into our 
higher risk uh, basket. I'd probably say is at the uh, at the um, most more secure side of that basket. Um, Heritage Bank uh, was a seven and a quarter percent fixed rate bond that just came out for five years. That's um, th that's very attractive in a falling interest rate environment. Our concern really with that issue was more to do with um, uh, it's a triple B company and so it's a much smaller company so we still put it into our riskier uh, riskier type assets. Um, by contrast, um, AFIG notes which uh, we were quite vocal about, we really liked back in December last year, that's the Australian Foundation Investment Company notes. Um, that's only paying six and a quarter percent but it had a nice uh, call option uh, attached to it. Um, uh, again, that that is really uh, in our low risk basket because uh, if you look at that company, there's 400, sorry, less than that, there's about $300 million worth of debt um, against a $4 billion portfolio, which uh, you could say is pseudo ASX 200. So the, the risk to us there is if the ASX 200 falls by more than 90%, there wouldn't be enough assets to cover uh, paying out the, the notes holders. Um, I think the likelihood of that happening is uh, uh, is very far, uh, yeah, it, it's very unlikely to happen. Um, ANZ subordinated notes, NAB subordinated notes, they're higher in the debt structure, they're for a fixed term, um, and so we're, we're comfortable putting them in the um, in the secure basket. PIMCO we've added in here is, is one of the bond managers that we use um, extensively within our portfolios. PIMCO are the second largest bond manager in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and widely regarded as one, being one of the best uh, best managers out there. Um, so, in fact, actually, what we do with Pimco is uh, because it's it's a managed fund with a portfolio of these assets. Where's my cursor? Here we go. Uh, we'll actually typically allocate something like seventy percent into this section and about thirty percent. Break it down that way, so it's thirty percent would be allocated to here. But again, you know, this, um, uh, it's a really nice bond, uh, bond fund to use. Um, so, yeah, actually just going on to PIMCO, uh, if, uh, for investors who are just saying, um, look, I'm just looking to get some, uh, some allocation to fixed income, um, it's all a little bit too difficult. You can actually access the funds on our website, um, fundsfocus.com.au. Uh, we've got the Australian Bond Fund and the um, global bond fund from from PIMCO. Um, what we like about them is is that they're actually quite active uh, within their management, and um, uh, we thought we'd give you a scenario of uh, uh, you know where they were at in May 2011 and where they were uh, just at recently as well. So if we look at um, the quality of their underlying holdings, uh, they had 44% in AAA uh, rated. Uh, bonds, um, only 9% in sub-investment grade and 12% in triple Bs. Triple B is around the area we're looking at with Heritage Bank, if that gives you some, uh, uh, um, it give, yeah, so you can understand where, uh, where they sit there. Um, the estimated yield at that point was 8.1% per annum and the average quality was A plus. By contrast, if we look at where they are as of 30th of April, you can see that they've moved a significant holding into um, more secure type bonds. So 66% in AAA now. And I think this is, this is pure that they've been quite vocal about the European debt crisis becoming more and more of an issue and have moved more and more towards secure assets and as a result of that we can see that the average quality is now um, double A um, and at the same time the yield has, has dropped a little bit to um, to account for uh, uh, the increase in quality that we've seen there. Um, so you know it just shows that they are quite active in terms of how they're managing their portfolios. Um, so then if we look at uh, their performance um, versus uh, equities over, over that period. So over the last year they've yielded 10%, uh, one and a half has come from growth, 
Um, eight and a half percent has come from distributions. Um, over three years, 4.4% uh, 4 .4 a year has come from growth. Eight and a half percent a year has been distributions. Um, at the same time, the ASX yielded 10%. Or ten and a half percent in the last year, ASX was down four um, percent, and over five years, the ASX has averaged minus two point two percent a year, whereas um, bond fund has has achieved achieved a return of nine percent a year over that period. So thanks for your um, thanks for your time, um, and uh, oh, here we go.